Now we will hear from Anne Svetkovic. Um, I too want to thank Anne Snitow for allowing me to contribute to the chorus of voices. Um, I'm just meeting her for the first time, but she is one of the people who's in my icons of feminist theory since I'll locate myself and this will be important as preamble to my talk as um, part of a generation of <coughs> feminists shaped by uh, two books, Powers of Desire and The Politics of Sexuality, the book that came out of the Barnard, um, infamous Barnard Sexuality Conference, which is only now being historicized in some new and different ways. So I was shaped in the early 80s as a graduate student by that <coughs> sex wars moment in feminism in a way that has consequences for how I um, understand, understood then and now seek to re-understand um, the history of the 70s and the culture of the 70s. So, um, recently I got an email from my friend Robin Wigman who uh, asked a group of us to um, name feminist figures or schools of thought which had been repudiated or routinely dismissed. That is, not even taken seriously enough to be worth the time to engage with critically. And this, I think, is an issue for those of us who teach feminist or queer studies. And I think repudiation could be a category we could spend a good part of the day working with. Um, a bunch of names came up. I'm not going to list them all because I forgot to bring the email that lists them. But um, Catherine McKinnon was there, of course, Andrea Dwork and others. My vote was for. Um, anything that has to do with uh, lesbian separatism, a whole category of work and thinking. I also would love to talk about uh, spirituality as another category that often gets dismissed. Um, I, I, I mentioned um, lesbian separatism in part because I was thinking in particular about the Michigan Women's Music Festival, which is, now I've just dropped out again, which is currently known primarily for the exclusion of transgender people by its women born women admission policy, but which has also been infamous as a site of problematic cultural feminisms and essentialisms, inadequate racial diversity, SM bashing and other forms of anti-sex politics, over the top political correctness and lesbian processing, and goddess worshiping spirituality. That's just a few. Um, I first came to the festival in the 1990s, or as we say, arrived on the land. Um, I was a feminist academic deeply steeped in post-structuralism, pro-sex feminism, and queer theory, and had very little interest in women's music. And I was deeply skeptical about what seemed like a relic of the 1970s. And I have to also shout out to my girlfriend, Gretchen Phillips, who's the one who got me there. Uh, since then, after working at Michigan for over 15 years, I have had my expectations about lesbian feminism consistently disrupted by the festival's stubborn persistence some 35 years after its founding as a women-only space. And that in itself is, is something to, um, to think about. The 35th anniversary of the festival will be this August. Even though I support trans inclusion, I have also developed a humble respect for the histories that have led festival organizers to defend its, its admission policy in the face of what looks like another attack on the hard-won principle of women-only space. And we could think here about what's going on with feminist presses, with feminist bookstores. I have a student who did a dissertation on the history of uh, feminist bookstores as, um, well, Nancy Fraser writes about it as feminist um, public culture, which has been um, drastically eroded over the last number of years. Uh, so it's important, I think, to look at that category. From inside the festival, too, where I work alongside many self-identified boys and men and where top surgeries are now exposed alongside of naked breasts, the contradictions of the festival's actual practice make me hesitate before making dismissive generalizations or repudiations. My experiences at Mitchfest have made me question the story of 1970s feminism that I absorbed as a graduate student during the peak of high theory in the 1980s, when vast swaths of 1970s feminist theory, history, and practice was cordoned off as essentialist or unrealistically utopian. I developed a fuller appreciation for the challenges of documenting activism when doing oral histories with AIDS activists and seeing how quickly the ephemeral networks and conversations 
foundations that inspire activism can be lost, even in that case 10 years later. I was doing a project at the end of the 90s on the end of the 80s. One of my motives for documenting the festival also has been to showcase its status as an enclave of freaky queerness at a time when cultural visibility and marriage equality promote only the most banal forms of homonormativity. Mishfest encompasses the legacies of riot girl pump sub punk subcultures, a strong African-American and African diaspora performance culture that comes from Sweet Honey in the Rock and Castleberry and Dupre, among others, a gender-bending transformation of masculine and working class labor, and approaches to community building that combine punk DIY, lesbian feminism, hippie countercultures, and working class traditions, all of which weren't a good deal of alternative historical ethnographic work. A full account of Mishfest requires that we dispense with overly simplistic dichotomies between second wave feminism and third wave feminism, or perhaps dispense with those terms altogether, given the tendency to define third wave against rather than in continuity with second wave. That also could be a topic for further discussion. It's come up as a thread already. Um, uh, and I appreciate Nicole's uh, discussion also of the way in which uh, a racialized history of feminism would um, really disrupt that, that model. Moreover, the festival's apparent anachronism might well be its value, particularly if we think anachronism on the model of queer temporalities as formulated by Beth Freeman, Heather Love, Jack Halberstam, Carolyn Dinshaw, and others, who have suggested that feeling backward is a, is a way to move forward, that embracing mistakes, failures, but also utopian aspirations might be a way to build for the future. And I'm also struck by the way in which, um, I know it's a really packed schedule, but it seems important in order to be able to represent the many different forms of feminist practice and theory that are now available to us. So just the thread around intersectionality is really, really important. And I wanna just suggest that from my world in queer studies, this work on queer temporalities, which some of us are deeply familiar with, so I could give you a whole bunch of footnotes, sorry, I don't have them on the PowerPoint, and which also may be less well known to people who are circulating in other domains. And I think one of the challenges will be how to make these very well established kind of sub bodies of theory um, speak to one another. Um, so if you don't know about queer temporalities, go find out. Um, I wanted to introduce this project uh, at this conference that is the discussion of, um, of Michigan in order to underscore that a gender studies program for the 21st century might not need to repudiate women's studies in order to create gender studies, as has sometimes been the case when adding or substituting gender for women, and that one of its tasks might be to find new ways to historicize the 70s and to take up the methodological challenges of archiving activisms that are also deeply personal. And here, part of my goal, I'm not going to be able to do justice to it, but it comes out of the work I, I do around affect and politics. I think this was also present in Dina's paper last night. Uh, since Ann Stoller's gonna be responding, I would also suggest your work has, for me, been exemplary of a model of what it means to do histories of intimacy in the way in which that drastically transforms both the history you get and also the methods by which you produce it. So I think 70s feminism would be a very interesting locus for a more thoroughgoing attention to the relation between affect and politics, including the phenomenon of repudiation. One inspiration for my Mishfest project is a new generation of contemporary queer art that rather than being embarrassed or ashamed about 1970s feminist utopias or lesbian separatisms, has been eager to embrace them. This development is explicitly articulated in Toronto artist Alison Mitchell's Deep Les Manifesto, which you see part of here. Um, which suggests that rather than defining feminist and queer politics in opposition to lesbian feminism, it might be possible to use it as a resource, as well as to combine what are often seen as conflicting forms of feminism. In the Deep Les Manifesto, Mitchell says, Deep Les was coined to acknowledge the urgent need to develop inclusive liberatory feminisms while examining the strategic benefits of maintaining some components of a radical lesbian theory and practice. This project is carefully situated not to simply, not, not to simply hold on to history, but rather to examine how we might cull what is useful from lesbian histories to redefine contemporary urban 
open lesbian and queer existence. In so doing, lesbian is resurrected as a potential site of identification rather than one of depoliticized apathy or worse shame. Calling for a both and rather than an either or approach to different generations and styles of feminism, including the debates so fraught at Michigan about transgender exclusion, inclusion versus women only space, Mitchell seeks to use radical lesbian feminism as an inspiration for a range of art practices and public formations. Um, Mitchell is both a feminist theorist, she's on the faculty in women's studies at York University where she also got her PhD in women's studies. Kate was talking, uh, Kate Eichhorn was talking about um, some of the programs in, in Canada um, where I also try to spend as much time as possible as a Canadian national. Um, and I, I just want to share with you some of this um, uh, generation of work which has actually been putting pressure on me generationally um, to rethink um, my own dismissal of certain forms of 70s feminism and this um, this really comes out of the conversation Kate that you and Allison and I had a couple of years ago in Toronto when we realized that there were these um, as we all know very um, uh, quick uh, generational moments within feminist theory that I realized I perhaps as a teacher of feminist theory had been not teaching the things that then uh, uh, people of the generation of my students were going out and finding for themselves and going, well, why not read Money Fatigue, for example? So um, uh, I just want to talk about art practice also as a way that certain kinds of political work is being done. Uh, Mitchell's work borrows from the thrift store, the crocheted Afghan, the fun fur, to create um, utopian spaces. This is a, a remaking of a, um, a space into a, a feminist gathering place. Um, fun fur, also borrowing, borrowing from pornography and Playboy bunnies to create these fun fur um, uh, paint by numbers. Uh, she's done a whole series of lady Sasquatches to create a, a kind of Sasquatch gathering. Um, these giant uh, lesbian feminist monsters, as she calls them. And then here's the Hungry Purse, which was a, a use of shag rugs, crocheted um, uh, um, afghans and pillows to create this vaginal space that you walk into. Um, other work, uh, Lesbians on Ecstasy. Hey, the Canadians are really getting the shout out here. Um, uh, who's... Uh, um, album we know you know is uh, based on on uh, uh, Meg Christian's um, 1970s women's music classic I know you know uh, there's a great video I wish I could show you that Kate Hardy did um, for their uh, song um, sisters in the struggle uh, that has the line we've been waiting all our lives for our sisters to be our lovers uh, which features uh, the labrys and the woman sign and women frolicking in the Michigan woods but here's an example of the way in which they've appropriated um, 70s um, women's music culture this is uh, lesbians on ecstasy posing in um, 70s garb and some of uh, the video footage was also filmed at Michigan at the festival Another example, um, J.D. Sampson, um, who's perhaps known to some of you as a member of the band um, La Tigra and currently a member of the band Men. This is a calendar collaboration with photographer Cass Bird called J.D.'s Lesbian Utopia in which um, the mobile home culture meets um, lesbian feminist land politics, um, rainbows and, and uh, Pickup trucks never look so good. But here, this sort of fantasy, um, partly I think also from the work that um, bands have done traveling on the road, of kind of being on the road and being in a, in a group or a collective um, together. Um, here you have a kind of appropriation of land and landscape. Um, another photographer, Tammy Ray Carland, um, also uh, has done work to create a, a feminist um, uh, record pr production um, company um, and this done a lot of work. I'm going through this really fast but just hoping that this d visual display uh, does some work. And so she's used, appropriated the landscape photograph to do a series of photographs of women's land, some of which um, was done at Michigan. Um, here's the Port of Janes at Michigan. And this is actually from Camp Decadence which is the SM um, friendly space on the land. Um, but there are no people in these photographs, so it's all about the land and the way in which you see the marks of a certain kind of 
um, presence there um, on the land. And then finally, um, the work of Ginger Brooks Takahashi in, um, in uh, collaboration with a range of different people. And Ginger is also a member of LTTR, which is a very important um, feminist collective of this century, modeled in many ways after feminist um, collectives of the 70s, using the collective as a model for doing a range of different kinds of art products. And this is a kind of reappropriation of the map in order to imagine a, a fantasy lesbian space. And she just did another one of um, the Isle of Lesbos, and you're not gonna be, see the fine print, but it's a bunch of different quotations from Monique Fatigue's um, dictionary, uh, returning to that classic. Um, so I, I can't do justice to all of this work. I just wanna indicate that it's out there and, um, and mention that part of what's going on is an ability to be able to combine lesbian feminism with contemporary dyke style in that both and way that Mitchell describes, um, as well as to be unafraid to mix genres. So Leslie's on X does uh, dance electronic music, but can combine that with traditions of women's music. You have various genres of um, pornography being mixed with women's art, um, fun fur mixed with uh, you know, organic textiles and so on. Um, one of the things though I wanna be a bit careful about is that um, the, there not be just a total slippage to the present and a kind of hipness around something like Michigan uh, that then kind of still gets left in the past. So the work I'm doing, I would like to be able to set alongside of this work as a kind of publicity showcasing of what is also um, still a complicated uh, culture at Michigan itself. And I'm not gonna have time to describe in detail the work that I'm doing there, but the two topics I've really wanted to focus on are performance and work and their intersections. So performance is um, interestingly intergenerational and um, utopian there. This would speak to um, Judith's work in, in, uh, in A Queer Time and Space when she talks about um, Farron performing with um, Kaya Wilson from the Butchies and uh, Bitch and Farron have recently done a collaboration together that's a very interesting intergenerational connection. Uh, also, I would want to mention the work of, say, someone like Toshi Regan working with her mom, Bernice Regan Johnson. There's a very interesting mother-daughter combo, but um, uh, one that includes uh, some other genders there. Uh, and also the um, Rock Chick Slicks, which is put on at Michigan, which is a variety show that Allison Palmer of Betty, who you also get to see on the L Word, organizes to um, bring us various kinds of um, cover performances of popular music by lesbians. So uh, just think, for example, about um, Holly Near doing a version of Ricky Martin doing La Vida Loca, um, just to think about the way things are being mashed up at Michigan. Um, I just want to close by talking about archives because this is another little mission statement I want to make for your new program, um, that, uh, that archiving is important, um, it's challenging. So with Michigan, for example, uh, I face a set of uh, really complicated uh, ethnographic and ethical issues around how to incorporate many vocal voices and points of view that are part of a collective history. Um, I wanna, uh, how to capture its ephemeral qualities as a short-term community and a set of live performances and events, how to respect the efforts of organizers to avoid publicity in order to fly under the radar and retain the land status as a sacred space. And I wanna here just show you a couple of images from this project by Angela Jimenez, this book that was just published um, last year called Welcome Home. It's currently on display at the, at the community center just down the street, so go see it there or buy a copy of the book. Um, Angela is also a freelance photographer at the New York Times, so if you noticed, for example, the story last year about women's lands in the New York Times and wondered how it got there, it's partly because there are now people like Angela who move back and forth between Michigan and um, publicity for lesbian feminist issues in the New York Times, which may be a market issue to go back to Nancy Fraser's um, comments last night, but it's complicated in the sense of what Lisa Henderson has called relays between subcultures and mass culture. Um, and here's another one of the Michigan images. Um, so I would say that one important project for 21st century gender studies is archiving collectives and activisms of many different kinds, both formal and informal. The New Schools program can take advantage of many resources and models in the immediate vicinity, and I'd urge you to you know, keep thinking about 
where you are, um, from public institutions such as the New York Public Library to grassroots organizations such as the Lesbian History Archives and the Audre Lorde Project, as well as the innovative university-based collections such as Barnard Zine Collection and the Fales Collection at NYU's um, downtown and newly forming Riot Girl Archives. I just want to say I'll be very sad if the 1980s and 90s ends up better archived than the 1970s because all of the young feminists who were trained up in the importance of history and archiving are now archiving their own 1990s youth. So we need to, our generation needs to catch up. <laughs> um, for purposes of our discussion today, I introduce Mishfest and uh, the lesbian separatism and visions of utopia that it represents to raise questions about the work of historicization and its relevance to the new gender studies program at the new school. I want to see care and attention to feminist histories, including its mistakes and messy forms of his sisterhood. I would hope that the new gender studies program would not need to create itself through acts of repudiation and can instead take advantage of a moment when it is possible to return to the 1970s without disdain for essentialism or its being unfashionable or for infighting. This return to the past will likely be one that involves taking stock of our affective relations to the past. And again, the queer temporalities work is really helpful here of the many ambivalences, hopes, and critiques it can inspire. How can we renew a connection to the past while also holding open what it can mean? The younger artists whose work I have shown serve as inspiration because they are able to take up the past and make it their own, undeterred by the critical work of my generation. They also suggest that art can be an innovative form of public archive, and here I want to um, note what I thought was important about Val Smith's mention of the work at Princeton to make um, art central to the public work that the Princeton program is doing. And so I, I want to just throw that in because there's been a lot of focus on social sciences and I want to make sure art and humanities is, is present there too. I hope that better histories of 1970s feminism might be one project for a new gender studies program rather than keeping them occluded by the repudiations of feminist theory and critique. If the example of Michigan is any indication, there are many um, fine spectacles and messy feelings awaiting our attention. Thanks.